Ms. Luca could sit down, please. Okay. So, welcome to the Christmas edition of the Pastor's Bible Study. Uh, glad to have you all here. As you see, there's cookies, uh, because you probably haven't had enough sweets yet, and uh, a little sugar could always be good. Yeah, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever. So, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for gathering us together tonight. We're so grateful for this opportunity to study your word. And as always, Lord, we invite you into this time. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your Holy Spirit to move among us, give us wisdom <coughs> and understanding. Open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds so that we may receive and understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, just one thing before I forget, if you did not get a thank you gift from me, a uh, Christmas ornament, I do have a few left up here, or if you know somebody that didn't get one, please grab one before you leave. So, as we get ready to move into our break, uh, we are turning another page here. Um, we are moving into Holy Week. We hit Palm Sunday today which feels a bit discordant, right? Mm -hmm. The week of Christmas, we're going to study Palm Sunday. The other Holy Week. But uh, they all go together, you know? Um, he, he was born in order to make his way to the cross. So last time we looked at the, the rich young ruler and blind Bartimaeus, we saw Jesus predict his death for the third time. We saw that incredibly audacious request from James and John. Jesus, let one of us sit at your right hand and one of us sit at your left. Um, he has taught them a lot, but they still have a lot to learn, right? And so today, we're going to see Jesus enter into Jerusalem and judge Jerusalem. So let's pick up with Mark chapter 11 would help if I turn to Mark rather than Matthew. And uh, let's read the first 11 verses. And who would like to be my reader? Oh, yes, Vivian, you had already volunteered. If you could read the first 11 verses. Yes. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus went, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had, laid, they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay, we'll pause there for a few minutes. So remember, we, we left last week. Jesus was passing through Jericho which was the final stop on that pilgrimage up to Jerusalem. You will always, always, always see in the Bible they go up to Jerusalem because metaphorically speaking, Jerusalem is the pinnacle. You know, the place, the one place where God at this point had set his presence to dwell on earth in the temple, in the most holy place. So that is the high point 
on the earth. But also, if you're traveling from Jerusalem, which is very close to the lowest point on earth, remember in that 18 to 20 mile stretch of road, they literally went up 3,200 feet of elevation. So they were probably really glad to finally make it to Jerusalem after walking up for 18 miles. They stop at two small villages on the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know if they, it's not on the back, is it? No. Um, the geography of Jerusalem is such that between the Temple Mount, Mount Zion, and the Mount of Olives, there is the Kindred Valley and a, a small creek, the Kindred Creek, that runs between them. And on the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you keep going up the Mount of Olives and further, then there are two small villages. One of them is Bethany, and that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, oh, okay. and Bethphage as well. So keep in mind, we've got pilgrims from all over the world coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. The, it's hard to estimate how many people lived in Jerusalem at the time. Most people <coughs> say something like 100,000 people lived in greater Jerusalem at this time. But one of the Jewish historians, a man named Josephus, recorded around this time, they did a count of how many lambs were slaughtered for the Passover. And by that count, and keep in mind, in order to have a lamb for the Passover, you had to have 10 people in your house. So that's a lot of lamb. They estimate that the population swelled from around 100,000 to a million. Wow. wow. I mean, there are people everywhere and staying wherever they can possibly stay. Everybody has opened their home to somebody. The law stipulated if you lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem, you had to go to Jerusalem for Passover, for Pentecost, and for the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. But everybody around the world had a desire to go to Jerusalem for at least one of the feasts. And it's even built into the Passover liturgy that is still used today, that has not changed for thousands of years. <clears throat> they end by all saying together, next year in Jerusalem. So Jesus is part of all of these people who are walking together to Jerusalem, they're all coming for a religious purpose. When you get that many people together in a religious fervor, especially when that religious fervor is tied to a political fervor, what do you have a recipe for? Disaster. Disaster, riot, violence, chaos, do you see now why the Romans were so nervous at Passover? Because what does Passover celebrate? Uh, the uh, angel of death passing over the uh, Israelites when right. Jesus said, let my people, when God said, let my people go. Right, the Exodus. Yeah. Moses leading the children of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, the tenth plague being the plague of the firstborn. If they smeared the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts, the angel of death would pass over, hence Passover, that house. You were protected by the blood of the lamb. That was at his birth. Huh? That was at his birth. Did that happen when Jesus was born? There was no angel of death at his birth. This was at the Exodus. <laughs> yeah. But didn't they do that when born. Jesus was born? Not that I know of. Because uh, of uh, Herod killing the two-year-olds and under? There was, Herod did kill the two-year-olds and oh, under. So 
That's two different events. It's two different okay. events. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. glad you asked that question because I thought the same thing. Yeah, because didn't they still smear blood? Could they check that house for the two-year-olds and under? No. Yeah. That you may be thinking of a dramatization. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you. We, they may have done that, but that's not in the Bible. Okay, all right. So they may have done it, but yeah. Okay. But um, so you've got in your mind, we're celebrating our freedom, but look at these lousy blankety blanks who are occupying our land. So the Egyptians get equated with the Romans, and if the Messiah King would come, we could kick these Romans out and be free again. That's what we're waiting for. So all of this, keep this in your mind as Jesus first stops in Bethany and he and his disciples probably stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. I mean, we can make that assumption because he goes back and forth to Bethany. It's probably where he stayed during this week. Other Gospels, particularly the Gospel of John, tell us that Lazarus being raised from the dead happened not that long before this. Lazarus is raised in John chapter 11. That's the, according to John, the straw that broke the camel's back, that they really determined they've got to get rid of Jesus now, which is laughable when you think about it. A man who could raise people from the dead, let's kill him. Let's think about that. But Lazarus is raised in John chapter 11, and Palm Sunday happens in John chapter 12. So they're very close. And this could explain why there are so many crowds that gather also in Jerusalem. Yes, there's all the people coming with Jesus, but there's also a group that comes out from Jerusalem and meets him, and they all together have the big Palm Sunday parade. Maybe they've heard, here comes the guy that raised that dead guy up the road. So Passover was a time to celebrate liberation, and the tensions are heightened, but Jesus, as we see, has a plan. He has planned all of this out as to how exactly he's finally going to enter Jerusalem. And this is the time he, for the very first time, publicly claims and announces, yes, I am the Messiah. And he does it by riding in on a donkey. So we've got all this business here of Jesus sending two disciples to go and get uh, here a colt, a young male donkey that no one has ever ridden. There's a lot of questions as to did Jesus arrange this ahead of time with somebody or is there some kind of miracle going on here where Jesus gave them the right words to say that he knew would, it's never explained to us. We just know Jesus knew how to get a hold of the right colt that he was going to ride in on. It is a bit of a miracle. This colt has never been ridden, and yet Jesus rides it. Most animals aren't happy the first time. Right. Somebody wants to ride them. You know, it takes a while. Now, Matthew tells us that the mother also came, the mother of the colt, the mother donkey walked alongside, which would have helped, Yes. let's be honest. Yeah. I also think the colt is a lot wiser than the people in Jerusalem. The colt recognizes his master, his creator, and sure, you can ride on my back. Whereas all the people that claim to know God, that didn't recognize, I mean, there's a lot of irony here that the donkey is smarter than the people. But if you've observed people for any length of time, that really shouldn't surprise you. 
you know, at least it doesn't surprise me. Uh, Numbers 19, Deuteronomy 21, both stipulate that any animals dedicated for use in the temple were never to have been worked. So this is the perfect animal to use. No one has ever written on it. It's never been used for work. It is spotless, pure, fresh, however you want to look at it. Now, why, why would Jesus ride in on a donkey? Would you pick a donkey? Isn't that what kings did? What kings Say more. When a king entered the yes. village, they were riding on a donkey. It was significant what type of animal a king would ride in on, particularly a conquering king. He was king. coming in peace. If, a, if he rode a donkey, he was coming in peace. If he rode a horse, that was the end of you. Yeah. So if the conquering king came on a donkey, your life was saved. Jesus is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince. prince of peace. He comes riding in on a donkey. Also in the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, which is quoted in other gospels, the Messiah is portrayed as coming to Jerusalem riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9. So Jesus is fulfilling prophecy here. And the people know exactly what he's doing. They knew their Bible. And they'd heard all these rumblings about this guy that could raise people from the dead and can give sight to the blind and is teaching in a way that nobody has ever taught before. He's got authority. And could he possibly be the one? And boom, here he comes, basically waving a sign that says, Woo, it's me! He comes riding on a donkey, and they go crazy. Now, there's one other, and I just learned this. There was a rabbinic tradition. It's not in the Bible, but it was a tradition from the rabbis that when the Messiah came, if Jerusalem was not ready for him, he would come riding on a donkey. If Jerusalem was ready, he would come riding on a white horse. What did Jesus ride in on? Were they ready for him? No. But when we studied Revelation and Jesus came oh. back, yes. what's he riding on? A white horse. A white horse. They'll be ready. Kind of interesting, isn't it? So this is his public announcement. I am the Messiah. And they recognize it after all that secrecy, after all that time that Jesus said, don't tell anybody about this. It's not time. Don't spread this around. Now, finally, it's time for him to acknowledge he is the Messiah. And five days later, what do they do to him? Crucify. You see why all the secrecy? Yeah, but he didn't fulfill their idea of the prophecy. They were looking for David. Yes. They were waiting for somebody to take One names and kick behind. To come in and kick everybody out. And yeah. Sit on the throne. Yeah. This humble little dude couldn't fill the shoes. They, uh, this weeping man who comes in peace was not the kind of Messiah they wanted. But at this point, they're thrilled. Which is why the word that I always associate with Palm Sunday is bittersweet. Because Jesus gets the praise that is rightfully his, but it's fickle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last. It doesn't go deep. Five days later, those same people, at least some of those same people, that shouted Hosanna were screaming for his blood, mm -hmm. shouting crucify him. What changed? We're going to see that over the next mm -hmm. several weeks, aren't we? Basically, what, what Rita just said, he, he disappointed their expectations. But I think he didn't, he didn't kick the Romans out quickly enough. And you can never count on the mob. Yeah. Mob mentality changes like that. 
And if you watch Jesus Christ Superstar, one of the uh, characters, the, the man playing Pilate, comments bitterly, you Jews have your messiahs by the sack full. <laughs> and there's all kinds of people claiming to be the messiah, and they all died, and nothing ever came of it. And so I'm sure some of them said, well, here we go again. Another one. And little did they know, three days later, he rose again. This one was for real. So, but yeah, there is a little bit of a mystery how quickly people turned on him. But then that happens today, too, it doesn't sure does. it? Yeah. We like to set up our heroes and then knock them down. We, one day, were soaring high on faith. I love Jesus. Jesus is great. He's super great. And then a few days later, we've got a pounding headache, and we stubbed our toe. And, <laughs> you know, we almost ran out of the gas. Prices went up, and they didn't have the brand that I wanted of uh, bread at the <laughs> store. Before we know it, we're what? <laughs> Why would God do this to me? So, but here at least, they're thrilled. They quote from Psalm 118, which is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. That's where the word Hosanna comes from. Hosanna means save us now. Uh, it's rooted in the Hebrew word for save, where we get the name Joshua or Jesus. Salvation is what the name means. Um, so they're, they're yelling, save us now, Jesus. They throw their cloaks down. Basically, they're giving him the red carpet treatment so that his poor colt's hooves would not be hurt. And they throw their cloaks on the colt as a saddle as well. They wave palm branches. It's still a symbol of Israel today. It's still on the shekel coins, palm branches. So it's sort of like us waving American flags at a parade. And they shout from <clears throat> Psalm 118, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, referring to the Messiah coming into the temple, um, uh, coming through the gates of the temple in Jerusalem. And blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They are saying, basically, we agree, we believe you, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. But Jesus knows that judgment is coming. Luke, the very next thing that Jesus does in Luke is he goes and he weeps over Jerusalem because he knows within a generation Jerusalem is going to be utterly destroyed. AD 70, over a million people are killed. I think that's right. Anyway, a lot of people are killed uh, in the uh, Jewish-Roman War. The temple is destroyed. Hundreds of thousands are put into slavery. I mean, it's utterly, I mean, it's just horrifying to read about what happened in that war. So other Gospels also, the Pharisees call upon Jesus to rebuke the crowds. The Pharisees are not happy by this Palm Sunday parade. Neither are the chief priests, because, of course, they're, they're just as scared of a riot as anybody else. Because if it riots, Rome's going to come down, and they're going to lose their positions. You know? Um, but instead, the judgment begins here. Jesus, verse 11, entered Jerusalem. And where did he go? To the temple. And he looked around at everything. But it was late, so he turned around and went back to Bethany with the twelve, probably to, again, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. And the next thing we're going to see is the next day he's going to go back into the temple, and that's where the cleansing of the temple happens. So he goes and he gets a good look around, and then the next day he responds. So this is not a quick knee-jerk, he, he thinks long and hard about this before he cleanses the temple, which we'll see next.
But questions on the first 11 verses before we move on? Yes? So the increase in population that came this particular, <coughs> this particular time was partially because of the, the uh, politics of the uprising. So I think from what I read, more people actually would come at Pentecost okay. because of better weather. It was in May or June. But Passover was a particularly meaningful celebration. And it was built into the liturgy next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So you had that many coming just because it was a deep desire to see the temple and the Holy Land. Um, quite a few came in the fall to the Feast of Tabernacles too, because that was the most joyful. But you said that the, it was normally like 100,000 and now it was a million, so. At one of the Passovers sometime around this time. Oh, okay, we don't know that it was I don't know exactly time. which year, I'd have to look that up. And but you, they did a count of the lambs, yeah. So do you think that when Jesus was there with late raising Lazarus, that he made the arrangements for all of this because he knew what was coming? It's entirely possible. And of course, uh, people would have heard about Lazarus, and so that may have sprung a lot of increased population. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I want to go see the guy that could right. raise people from the dead. That's not something you see every day. Well, and I, do you think that they thought he was the Messiah, or that he was just a... If nothing else, we're going to get a good show. Exactly, that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you, you, you can be sure there were, and Lazarus they had the could whole have spectrum. Made, uh, Lazarus could have helped with those arrangements. Oh yeah. Because they were good you friends. You can be sure a lot of people had, he, he gained a lot of friends after yes. he rose from the dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes well, once they cleaned him up a little bit, yeah. Once you die, you get this thing. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's read the rest of the chapter. Who'd like to read for me, picking up at verse 12 and reading to the end of the Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, It is not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then... Do you not believe it? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, 
for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do all these things. Okay. That's where we'll stop for the next couple of weeks. So we have another bookend situation here. Remember, whenever Mark or one of the Gospel writers tells a story within a story, so we have the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple, then the fig tree again, whenever you have those bookends, the two stories help interpret each other. They're related. That's why Mark tells it this way. So we begin with the fig tree, and a lot of people really don't like this. They don't like this at all. This is the only miracle that ends in death, except maybe the pigs. <laughs> Although Jesus isn't the one that killed the pigs. So, but Jesus did kill this fig tree. So we're told he's hungry. He's fully human. He gets hungry. And he sees a fig tree in leaf. That is an incredibly important detail here. So Mark tells us it's not the season for figs. This is March or April, because that's when the Passover comes. The Passover is tied to uh, the spring equinox and the full moon and all of that. So because we're on a lunar calendar here, it moves uh, anywhere from a month uh, from late March to late April. Um, so we're in March, April, and figs um, were the earliest figs would come in May and June. So we're just getting started here, expecting figs would be silly. There aren't any figs on the trees in March and April. But in March, a fig tree would sport small edible buds. You could eat the buds. And those buds indicated that figs were coming. In April, the tree would get large green leaves. The buds would fall off and figs would begin to grow. So if there are leaves on the tree, there should be at least some buds to eat or some small figs that are beginning to grow. This tree had leaves and nothing else. It, it, it was advertising, you can get some fruit from me, even though it's not the right time, the tree was saying, you can get fruit from me. And Jesus is hungry, and he goes, and there's nothing. That's the important part here. Jesus is going where there should be fruitfulness, and there's nothing. And then he goes where? To the temple. To the temple, where there should be fruitfulness. Right. There should be prayer. There should be worship. Mm -hmm. But we're going to find that's not what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's not there. Well, he didn't make any friends. No, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus curses this fig tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. If you're going to promise fruit and not deliver, then I'm not going to bless that. It's going to be a curse instead. Keep that in mind. So, again, all indicators show that there should be fruitfulness in the temple. They have, it's the temple. They have the word of God. They have the word of the prophets. They have the legacy of the covenant that God has made with his people. The priests are there leading worship each day. The sacrifices are still going on. And yes, there's nothing in the Holy of Holies anymore. There's no Ark of the Covenant. Because when they built the new temple, they didn't rebuild the Ark of the Covenant. So it's just an empty room. And the glory cloud did not take up residence in the new temple like it did in the first temple. 
but they still have the idea that God is here and they're going to worship. But there's no worship going on. So the point is, the point of the temple, and it's hard for us to think this way because so much has changed, but the point of the temple was if you wanted to worship God, you went to where God was. And he had chosen, in his incredible grace, to come down to earth in one place, in the Holy of Holies, enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant. He was in the tabernacle, then in the temple, then he withdrew his presence and didn't come again until Christ. So Christ, at this point, is the new temple. Jesus is the temple. Now, we are temples of God because God dwells in and with us. So we can worship wherever. But at this point, that hasn't happened yet. They're still going to the temple to worship God. And the point was, you wanted to get as close to that place as you could. Now, I gave you a map. I've given you this before. I gave you a, an illustration. This is how the temple was built. And depending on who you were, depended on how close you could get to the most holy place. So you see here in this area where you have the, the squares, that's the actual temple building itself. This whole area is the temple complex, but the actual building is right here where it says most holy place and holy place. It's little compared to how big the complex is. Although it was quite big, the complex was huge. <clears throat> so the most holy place, that's where the presence of God used to be at this point. Only one person was allowed in that room, the high priest. And then only one day a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which happened around August, September, October, September, October. And even then, he could only enter the most holy place carrying blood, which made atonement for the people. And even then, they put a rope around his ankle, and he had bells sewn onto his robe that the priest would stand outside. There's a big, heavy curtain that separated this room from the rest of the temple. As long as they heard the bells ringing, they knew he was still alive. <coughs> God had not struck him dead in anger. And if he ever did, that's what the rope's for. Yank him out of there. Because they weren't allowed in. So, I mean, worship was a serious thing. And it still is. You're coming into the presence of God. I shudder sometimes at how casually we do that. Yes, we can come in confidence because Christ has made it possible for us to boldly enter into the presence of God without fear. But we're still entering into the presence of the creator of the universe who died for us. And sometimes we come in like we're going to a movie. You know, I wonder if the pastor will be entertaining today. Uh, so... Only the high priest could come into the most holy place. The holy place, where the great menorah was, and the bread of the presence, and where the incense was burnt, and all of that. The priests, if you were a priest of any kind, you could go into that room and no further. Outside also is the court of the priests. That's as far as they can go. That's where the great altar is where the sacrifices were burnt. If you look, there's a large gate that people could look through to see into the priests, to see that happening. And if the doors of the temple building were open, they could maybe get a glimpse. But that's as far as they could see. In the gray shaded area was the court of the Israelites. That's as far as an Israelite man could go 
to pray. Were there rails or something that? There, there were, yeah, there were markers. Mm -hmm. And here is the court of the women. If you were an Israelite woman, you could go this far, so you could still see in to the temple. And there was then a, a wall that they found uh, the markers that said, if you are not an Israelite, if you're a Gentile and you go beyond this wall, we have every right to strike you down and kill you right then and there. And they would. But all around here, all around, was the court of the Gentiles. That's as close as you could get if you were a Gentile. This is where all of the activity was going on that Jesus protested against. Because in the court of the Gentiles, which is as close as any of us could get to pray, first off, there were the inspectors. So what did you do when you went to the temple? You prayed, yes. You brought your offerings, yes. But you also brought what? A sacrifice. Could you sacrifice just anything? No. No. Perfect. Depending on what kind of sacrifice you were going to make. Is this a fellowship offering? Is this an offering of atonement? Is this some other kind of offering? It would depend on what kind of animal. And it had to be perfect, without spot, without blemish. If it was a lamb, it had to be a one-year-old male lamb without spot or blemish. And so there were inspectors that would inspect the animal you brought to see whether it was fit for that. And guess what? They cost something. They weren't doing it for free. And it wasn't cheap. And they kind of were on the take with the temple business organization who were selling animals that had already been inspected. So it was very difficult to get your animal passed. They would find something wrong with it so that you would have to purchase animals which were pre-inspected and were there for purchase at the stalls in the court of the Gentiles. So you've come to pray, and there are cows, bulls, there are sheep, there are pigeons, all for sale. Imagine the sounds, imagine the smells. And meanwhile, there's commerce going on. Oh, and I forgot to mention, all transactions had to be done in temple currency. The temple had its own currency, its own shekels, because outside money was unclean. <coughs> So before you paid that inspector or before you purchased that animal, you had to exchange your money at the money changers' tables and guess who was favored by the exchange rates? Money you. <coughs> so the poor, because it specifically mentions pigeons, yeah. and pigeons were the offering of the poor. Mary and Joseph, when they go to make an offering to redeem Jesus, because he's a firstborn male, and so he belongs to God, so they have to make a redeeming sacrifice. They couldn't afford a lamb. They were allowed to offer two pigeons instead. The poor are being price gouged and exploited. And the Gentiles who have come to pray, how much praying would you get done? in the middle of jungle gyms. Yeah, really. Not much. And Jesus is angry. Righteously angry. There should be fruit here. And there's just leaves. John tells us he patiently makes a whip. <laughs> Think about Jesus braiding leather together, saying, I'm going to show them. <laughs> Righteously. 
This is not sinful anger. But when we picture Jesus, do we picture him with a whip in one hand, flipping over tables in the other hand, screaming, my house is to be a house of prayer for all peoples, and you've made it a den of thieves. That's not the Jesus I want to meet. But it is the Jesus we will be. Yes. So, okay, so these Israelites, they're supposed to be good practicing Jews, Jewish faith. How do they just, well, so I've already got two of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. How do they justify that? They're the authority. Well, they're the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah. I think God's the authority. He's the one that said, you never do these things, and they're doing them. It's really more the Sadducees here. Okay. Yeah. But, and where did you study, Mr. Durr, that you would come and question me? Uh, <laughs> That's what they would ask. That's what they asked Jesus at the end. Who do you think you are? Where have you studied? Show me your degrees. It's also a long, slow slide into that kind of sin. And our churches yeah. today are certainly not without sin. No. So we make so we make a little extra money. It's for God. Yeah. And like fancy robes. Yes. After all, I should look good. I'm great. I'm representing the Lord. <laughs> We, we can justify so much if we're not careful. And, and they thought they were doing good. We're allowing people to make sacrifices in the temple. Now, we're making huge amounts of money on their backs. But Capitalism is good. They're just dirty, sinful people. <clears throat> you know, they wouldn't be poor if God loved them. So those shiny suits on TV and those big television ministries, huh? <laughs> if you exactly just what, exactly what if you send in your $50, right. they will pray and bless this little cheap trinket and send it back to you. Yeah. Or this prayer rug or this whatever, yeah. Because, you know, that one guy, he needed, he needed his own private chat in order to yes. do the Lord's work. Yeah. 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 That really is yeah. useful. It, it, well, it would be. It would be. If, if I want to get the Lord's word out to other people, I need this jet. Yeah. You're not going to fly coach. Come on. So, yes, I mean, it's... We, we, can, we can justify so much. The, the heart is so deceitful. Well, I think the justification in itself is that Jesus is justified in being angry. Yes. That's what is very clear to me. Yes, this is, in, in fact, it's amazing he didn't do more. Right. That's his great restraint and patience. Um, because, you know, with one word, he could have blown up the whole thing. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. He flips over the tables the next day. They've set them back up. Yeah. Really? You know that. But isn't that what we do with sin? Jesus comes in and upsets our tables and calls us on our sin, and the next day we're busy setting our tables back up and doing the same thing because, gosh darn it, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Not when I'm as good as I am. Yeah. So he cleanses the temple. And for the third time, we're told, the chief priests and the scribes hear about it, they see it, and they seek a way to destroy him, but they fear him because the crowds are astonished. Oh, I bet they were. <laughs> I bet the crowds had a good old time that Monday. Um, and then evening comes and they go out of the city. They go back up the uh, Mount of Olives here after this demonstration. And the next morning, so we're on, we're at Tuesday now, and there's a, as you see, a, the other side, a lot of stuff happened on Tuesday. We're going to spend a lot of time on Tuesday of, the, of Holy Week here. Um, on the way back, uh, the next morning, they see the fig tree has withered all the way to its roots. And Peter remembers what happened the day before, Gold Star Peter. And Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. 
And we expect Jesus to talk about the fig tree and the temple and fruitfulness and all of that, but instead Jesus gives a teaching on prayer. Well, that's unexpected. <laughs> so well, that's what he wanted. Yeah, exactly. He always he gets the the topic back to what he wants to talk about. And what's going on here is Jesus is within days going to hand his ministry over to them. And what he's trying to get them to understand is that they will be able to do what he has done. By the way, that goes for us as well. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now in us. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Christ is now in us and so he says, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and he's talking about the Mount of Olives, be taken up and thrown into the sea. The sea is nowhere near, by the way. It will come to pass. If he believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So, has Jesus given us a magic formula? This is where reading in context is incredibly important. On the one hand, we have to read this teaching on prayer with all of the other teachings about prayer. And we have to read in context of what Jesus is talking about. We're talking about what hinders you from bearing fruit. If you pray in faith, that the barriers that are hindering you from doing what God has called you to do, they will be removed. We have the power and authority to remove any hindrances to the work of God here among us. This is not... But the key if, is to believe. Right? Yes, the key is to believe. Yeah. Not to pray wishy-washy. And, and, and to listen. I, I, I can't tell you the number of people that I prayed for this and I prayed for this and I prayed for this and they just don't listen. Because right. it might not necessarily be well, what God wants you to do. He may <laughs> ask for something, but he may not want that to be the... Or right. there's a roundabout way of getting there other exactly, than... Exactly, yes. The other thing is that praying to for what hinders us from bearing fruit to be removed is a very bold prayer. Because more often than not, that's going to be a painful process. Yeah. It's not going to feel good to have yeah. that removed from us. So, Lord, remove my courage. impatience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a dangerous prayer. Yeah. And yeah. it always hurts. <laughs> it always hurts. So, yeah, so, so my ESV study Bible here says, Trust God to move whatever hinders you from bearing fruit. And have faith and confidence that when he does it, it will actually occur. Have faith in God. First problem, so many of us are so timid. We don't pray with gusto. Mm -hmm. We're invited here to pray boldly with gusto and trust that God is still in the business of doing miracles. That God is still in the business of changing lives. That God is still in the business of healing and saving people and changing hearts and all of those things. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's not that he once did these great miracles, but now, well, he's kind of over it. <laughs> you know, that's Die. not what's happened. Praise God, you know. So we need to pray bold prayers, but as you were saying, we need to pray in God's will. He's never going to give us something that is against his will. So... The pattern that we've been given for prayer is the Lord's Prayer, which first I pray, I praise God, hallowed be thy name. Then I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, which is a bold prayer right then and there. Lord, we want earth to match the way heaven is right now. Yes, please. 
And then we get to our laundry list of things that we want. So first, get myself lined up with what God is doing. Well, if I'm praying within God's will, I can be as bold as I want, right? I can ask for a mountain to be uprooted and thrown into the sea if that mountain is in the way, whatever that might be. So praying to advance the kingdom, are we praying for that or is it, Lord, I want you to make my life more comfortable? He may or may not answer that prayer because your discomfort may actually be what advances the kingdom. Very often it is. Yeah, usually, unfortunately. <laughs> Usually, Janet muttered it under her breath. <laughs> she really is happy. <laughs> <laughs> she just sounded really angry tonight. <laughs> but there's one other piece here. There's one other piece to this equation. Forgiveness. If while you're praying, you realize you are holding anything against anyone, <laughs> Why does God have to meddle so much? I give up everybody else but him. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that crutch. I really like nursing it and turning it over in my mind and, and re thinking of how much of a martyr I am and how much self-pity is rightfully mine. Woe is me. Whoa, woe is me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how annoying they are. Do you know, have you seen the ugly clothes they wear to church? <laughs> and they must have bathed in that perfume. You know, they must have put on perfume every time they walked past the bottle. <laughs> Just the things that we can get under our skin and hold on to. If while you're praying and worshiping, I mean, God, Jesus is pretty, pretty clear here. Your forgiveness that you receive and the forgiveness that you give should be tied together. As much as you have received, so also you must give. And that is so hard. So hard. So very hard. I had an event like that this week. Um, I got a phone call that my son just had a stroke. Oh, I'm so Ooh, sorry. I'm an ice cream now for God. You gotta fix this. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm literally crying and weeping and just going to God and saying, please be with him, help him. Uh, he was up at the PAC Center. Uh, his wife was up at the PAC Center and needless to say, she was a basket mm. case. And she had a friend there who was very stoic at the time. And I was very concerned when I got there because I was told he wasn't able to communicate. He was having these problems and those problems. And I went in there, and, um, and, and at first she told me, well, his limbs are all moving. He can use his legs and his arms. Praise God for that. But he couldn't talk right. He was totally incoherent. He didn't know what he was saying. It was really kind of bad. And we were all really, and I was still praying and praying and praying. And then she comes out, and she says, he's talking better now. He can talk. And I'm like, oh, great. God is answering my prayers. Mm -hmm. And she's all crying, and she's doing all this stuff. I said, you should be excited. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm jumping for joy because I'm not seeing he's got this piece. I'm seeing God's taking this sucker home. And, and I was. And um, oh, that's awesome. I guess people think of me as a bit of a fruitcake, you know. <laughs> but you're not a fruitcake. She's <laughs> you, you, you fit right in. Have you looked around? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, he came, he came back. Uh, and they were going to send him down to the hospital. And uh, they sent him down to uh, Mercy West. They did these tests. There's no brain bleed. Thank you, God. There's no tumors. Thank you, God. His, his cholesterol's fine. Thank you, God. His sugar is fine. Thank you, God. His blood pressure was fine. Thank you, God. We do not see any evidence at all of a stroke. Wow. Thank you, God. 
And I, you know, and everybody's like, well, you know, could have been this, could have been that. I said, hey, it was God. I know. God answers my prayers. And he took care of this. And, and here's something else. His family has not been going to church regularly. They have a, this person might want to go, and that person doesn't want to go. And so nobody goes. They went to church Sunday. <laughs> they went to church. That. Uh, all of their friends that went to that church with them was somebody must have put the word out, and they're all I can't believe you're here, and yada yada yada. This is great, and um, and so I really hope that this awakens. Absolutely, if that's what it's, God it's was doing. It's kind of crazy because my other sons who didn't believe this whole godly thing at all started going to church when I told them he was having a baby, and uh, and they thought I was lying. And the Lord works what in mysterious ways. Yeah. If, if that's what they needed, if they needed to go through this scare, I mean, I don't know, and but I if mean, that's what like, they needed. And I guess I really was kind of like, is she crazy? She's going crazy, worrying, crying, everything's falling apart in her world, and I'm so excited. It's going to be okay. So, it's a matter of perspective. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of what's going to happen. Well, God's got this, so why are we worried about it? So. What did Jesus say to the disciples in the boat? O oh, ye of little faith. Yeah. And, and so often our faith is it's just little. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And we, we're called to have a big, that's what Jesus is saying, pray and, and have a big faith. Yeah. Because God, if God can raise someone from the dead, what, what, can't, he what do? can't he do? Now, does that mean he's going to do what I want? Not necessarily, no. because I don't have all the information. I can still pray boldly. And I do. But I also accept... If this is what happened and I don't understand it and I don't like it, thy will be done. And at some point, I'm going to understand it. Now, maybe not in this life. You know, why are all these terrible things happening? Why is God allowing all these terrible things happening? I, I, I don't know. But is God still God? Absolutely. And I can hold on to that and not fall apart in the middle of the hurricane. Despite all appearances. Despite all appearances, God is still in control. And there's yeah. better things to come. Yeah, and yeah, the future is bright. Mm -hmm. Gotta wear shades. Mm -hmm. So this last little bit here, and we'll wrap up. I realize it's past 8 o'clock, but this last little bit. Jesus comes back, and the posse <coughs> is there to meet him. <laughs> and they basically ask him, it's very interesting, they don't tell him that what he did was wrong. They, don't, they never address that. They never address his main concern, which is, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you've made it into a den of thieves. They attack him personally. Who do you think you are? By what authority... Are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Because we sure didn't. <laughs> and we're in charge. You know? And Jesus, like a good rabbi, answers a question with a question. I'll be more than happy to tell you that. But first you answer my question. And he gets them where it hurts. He says... The baptism of John, John the Baptist, his, his baptism, was that from heaven or was that from earth? Did John have authority from heaven to baptize or was he a fraud? He claimed authority, but he didn't really have it. He's just going out on his own. And Jesus has just sprung a trap on them because there's a whole, you know, all those people... Well, they've all come to the temple, as many of them as could, and they're standing around because we got a show going on here. <laughs> you know, politics is playing out. Forget C-SPAN. 
we're watching this. <laughs> you know, here's one rabbi arguing with other rabbis about religious things. This is entertainment. I've got 50 shekels on Jesus. <laughs> I've got 100 on the, the high priest. You know, you can just imagine. They're just, you know, they're, they're eating the popcorn. Like, okay, what's going to happen next, you know? And he sprung a trap on them. Now, all these people believe that John came from heaven. They all went out into the desert and got baptized. The religious establishment never believed. They never believed in John. Because they thought they had the power. Who's this John guy? Yeah. He didn't go to any of our schools. He wasn't fancy enough. No. Plus, he had the authority to call them a brood of vipers. Who does he think he is? Yeah. So they don't believe in John, but if they say that, if they actually tell the truth, they're going to get lynched. You know, like a lot of the politicians today, if they actually tell you what they believe, then they'll get voted out. So we've got all these platitudes that we say that'll get us elected and then we can do what we want. Right? We didn't invent that. That's been going on forever. So if we tell the truth, then we'll get lynched. If we lie, well, we can't do that because he, he already knows. We can tell he knows. So we'll hedge our bets and we'll say, we don't know. And Jesus says, if you're not going to, if you're not going to engage, if you're not going to commit yourself, if you're not going to tell the truth, I ain't playing this game. I won't tell you my answer either. And that's just the beginning of Tuesday. It's going to keep on going. And every group is going to come and try to get Jesus to disqualify himself to give some bad soundbite that they can play on the 24-hour news channels over and over again. That'll be published in Haaretz, the Jerusalem Press. Um, We'll get back to that in a couple weeks. A reminder, no Bible study next week. Um, Merry Christmas to you. Happy New Year. Any thank questions you. before we... Oh, thank you. Any questions before we wrap up? Judy, you had something? What was... Uh, this goes back a little earlier. Uh, you said Pentecost, Passover, and the Feast of... Tabernacles. Tabernacles. That's a feast in the fall, a very joyful feast where Israel basically has a national camping trip. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when is it in the fall? To the fall, in October yeah. usually. Yeah, you go, every, people go out in their backyards and stay in makeshift tents and lean-tos and such. And the purpose of that is worship as well? Worship and to commemorate when they wandered in the wilderness oh. and didn't have oh, permanent. So they're out in the wilderness, I get it. Reliving their camping experience. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, practicing this. They still do that. Yeah. The whole ceremony. Does so. manna come down too? I'm sorry? Does manna come down too then? Not no. usually. <laughs> usually they have to provide their own manna. <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, when, see where it says southern outer gates and the inner cloisters and all that? And there's arrows? Yes. So is that open or are there walls where it says the court of Israel men? The, there are gates there where... So people could see through into. Could see through. Now they'd be looking at a wall. Oh. But the Israelite men could enter their court through those gates that were... There were probably guards at each so gate. So really, all the people around, other than the men, could really see almost nothing. Except, you see where it says Eastern Inner Gate? Yes, but that, you better be right in front of that or you'd never, because heads are in the way, and if right. you're off to the side, you wouldn't see it. Right. Yeah. So the women couldn't see nothing. Well, the women could, from their court, they could see the altar, but they couldn't see, there's a lot they couldn't see. <laughs> we yeah. were put outside. Yeah. To do women's work. But the the temple itself was gorgeous. Yes. Herod had rebuilt it. 
tons. I mean, it was polished white marble and gold. It said, if you looked at it straight on as the sun was shining, you'd go blind. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of tourists came from all over just to see it. And was that typical of some of the churches way back when to build with a lot of gold inlay? Uh, uh, the, the temple was unusual <laughs> that it had a lot of gold. Um, certainly the early churches know that they wouldn't have had a lot of gold until after Christianity became an official, the official religion of the empire in the fourth century. Yeah, some of the Catholic cathedrals and stuff would have. Much later, yes. yeah. But yeah. a lot of the small churches, like our church, like over, in, like our size church over in England or whatever, would be very primitive. Right. So there's an infamous statement by one of the pre- Reformation popes as he's looking around St. Peter's mm -hmm. and the Vatican and he turns to I believe it's St. Francis and says no more can we say silver and gold have I none oh. and St. Francis replied true and neither can you say rise up and walk <laughs> oh, oh, pope didn't like that <laughs> but, uh, he made his whip Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, any other questions before we close? Thank you again. I can't do this without you. I was amazed you keep coming back. So let's give thanks to God. Lord, oh, as we move closer to Christmas, we're so grateful that the baby born in Bethlehem came to do all these things that we have been reading about and more. We're so grateful that you came to live and to die for us, that we might be your people, that we might be temples of your Holy Spirit to do your work in this world. We desire to do that, Lord. Give us courage, give us boldness, give us your vision and your wisdom. Help us, Lord, truly to celebrate this weekend and to shine your light in the new year ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, remember there are ornaments left for any that did not get one. Let's do some.